this is backstage. It's been around for about three years. Um, a lot of people have adopted it. A lot of companies are in various different states of adoptions. And, and the deployment, uh, the question about how to deploy backstage is really kind of relatively solved at this point. Spotify are doing a lot of work in order to speed this up, um, in both in the open source and in some, uh, some commercial features. Um, at Rody, you know, we've basically solved this problem for our customers. Also, it takes eight minutes to get a backstage tenant on Rody, um, and you could just log in and, and start using it and start setting it up, right? So um, the deployment piece is relatively solved at this point. And, and I think the community has moved on to this question of, well, now that we've got backstage, how do we adopt it? How do we get our teams to use it? How do we get the most value from backstage? So our next uh, guest uh, will be on the stage soon. I'd like to invite David Toot to the stage with me. Hey, Claudio. Hi there. Hi there. Um, did I get your name right? Uh, yeah, perfect, perfect. I'm actually really impressed. Thank you. <laughs> I went to listen how you pronounce it in another event, so I was sure what I was saying. <laughs> Appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. A lot of people get it wrong. Uh, so you're here with us to talk about Backstage, right? Yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've um, been working with Backstage for about three years. Excited to, to talk a little bit about what we've learned. Cool, um, I will leave you to talk uh, about Backstage and I will see you again at the end. All right, thank you. Okay, hey everybody. Um, thanks so much for the introduction, Claudio. I am David Chute, I am the founder of Rody. We do batteries included, maintenance-free backstage. Um, I'm gonna apologize in advance. Uh, I have a little bit of a cold today, so if I have to mute myself and kind of cough or sneeze, um, I will do that. And you'll just have to give me a second. I'll try and get back as quickly as I can. Um, just to kind of give you a bit of history, a bit of context on, on who I am and, and what Rody is, the developer journey the developer portal journey started for me about um, eight years ago in 2015. I joined Workday, which is a global HR technology company. Uh, I was the first engineer on a deployment UI that we were building inside the company for an internal platform. I uh, wrote the first line of code on that. And we slowly built that over the five years that I was at Workday into a developer portal quite similar to what Backstage is. If uh, people are familiar with that, I'll introduce it in a second. Um, so it had a software catalog, it had deployment tools, it had plugins um, and various other, other tooling that developers found really, really useful inside the company. And so seeing the success of that project in the first lockdown of COVID in 2020, I decided that was a good time for me to um, uh, hand in my notice and uh, take a leap of faith and start a company. Um, so I did that, you know, went the traditional path of, of VC funding and and, um, and, and and stuff like that. And um, uh, it was kind of fortuitous in the sense that Backstage was open sourced by Spotify basically in the same month as I uh, quit Workday to, you know, try and build my own developer portal company. Um, initially, it was a complete shock and surprise to me. And I thought, oh, crap, I'm after handing in my uh, notice and now my company is already dead because of um, the open source work that Spotify are doing. Um, but, you know, talked to Spotify, got to know a few people in there. They were happy to have us operating in the space as well and trying to uh, help them drive adoption and kind of awareness of backstage. And so we've been doing that since 2020. Um, as it stands at the moment, we've deployed more than 300 companies to production on Backstage. We have a ton of experience, both on the deployment side of Backstage, and we do offer it as a SaaS, but also on the adoption side. So we don't just give people Backstage and you know let them kind of uh, figure it out by themselves. We're there trying to help people in the trenches every single day to get the most from Backstage and actually be successful with it. And, and we take pride in that. Um, the future is, is um, it is bright for backstage and for roadie so we're invested in a couple of different areas so both um scorecards inside backstage and i'll talk about a little bit about that uh, later on we want to help people to measure the maturity of the software that they're building in their companies and also improve it over time um and then we're also really involved involved and in, in kind of focused on making it easier to adopt backstage so 
um, you know, it, it can take some effort to push out backstage to a uh, hundred or a thousand engineers inside your company. And we feel like there's a lot of work to be done in order to make that easier. And, you know, that's really what I'm here to talk about uh, today. So just before I move on to that, um, I just want to give people some context on what Backstage is. Uh, maybe you've been living under a rock for the past three years and you haven't actually um, come across it or you don't have that much experience with it. Just two things to say about it. One, really like the problems that it solves. And then also I'll just touch on the features briefly. and We'll go into more detail on, on those as we go through the slides. Um, I categorize the, the problems that Backstage solves really in two ways. One is what I would call the discoverability problem. So, you know, if you're an engineer working in a company with a hundred or a thousand engineers, uh, people are building things around you all the time. Software is changing, new things are going to production. And you're trying to, you know, you do have to work with these teams. You're not an island inside your company. And so it can be difficult to answer basic questions about the software that teams are building around you. You know, do we have a geocoding API? Does it have builds? Which team owns it? Where's the documentation for it? Who's on call for it, right? Like all of these simple questions can actually be quite difficult to answer inside a uh, quick growing and, and large engineering organization. And then the second order effect of that really is what I would call the standardization problem. So there are benefits to having some standardization around the software that teams are building in your company, right? You need to have certain security best practices. You need to have, uh, or it could be beneficial to deploy things in consistent ways and have a somewhat homogeneous production environment. Um, and this can be difficult, right? Teams are trying to move fast. You want teams to have autonomy. You don't want to enforce rules on teams and tell them they have to use certain technologies. Um, but you don't want chaos and you do want to have good reusability in your organization too. Um, and so managing that is what I call the standardization problem. And Backstage can really help um, quite acutely in, with both of these problems, uh, depending on the level of effort that you put in. So the way Backstage does that is with a couple of different features. You know, there's a lot of plugins for Backstage. The ecosystem is huge. The open source community is, is, um, is healthy and mature. Uh, but there's a couple of key features that I would call out that um, Backstage has that really help with these two problems. The first one is the software catalog. So Backstage at its core is a, an inventory of the software assets that you have in your company. So it's the teams who build software, the people who are on those teams, and then the software that they're building, right? The, the, uh, the microservices, if you want to call them that, they don't have to be, um, but all the software that teams are producing and working on every day and trying to improve the quality of so just being able to answer that question of what software do we have in our company is quite important. And Backstage helps with that by inventorizing the, the software that teams are building. Uh, on top of that, it brings a plugin ecosystem. Okay, So we, these, these plugins for things like PagerDuty or Fire Hydrant or Datadog, various other um, standard software that a lot of different companies are using, these plugins provide a window into that software, help to reduce the context switching by bringing information from those tools into a what you might call a single pane of glass inside Backstage. And what that means is that you can look up a piece of software that a team is building in your company and pull to get, Backstage will pull together or aggregate information from those different tools and make it available in one place. And the way it does that is with the plugins. There's lots of different tools that teams are using. The, 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 the landscape, the CNCF landscape is, is gigantic. Um, and by being an open source project, Backstage allows people to contribute plugins for all of these different tools. And we've seen that happen over the past three years. There are more than 100, maybe more than 150 plugins for Backstage now into all of these different tools. There's also a tech docs feature for Backstage, which could be quite important. So technical documentation, you're probably aware if you've worked at a few different companies, can be a bit of a struggle. It's difficult to get people to write documentation. It's difficult to find it if they do read it, or sorry, do write it. And Backstage helps by this by tying tech, technical documentation into the catalog where it's easier to find. Um, so you can look up a service in Backstage and you should be able to find the docs for it right there. Similarly with API specs, they can be right there in the catalog, organized by service and kind of easy to navigate. And then the last thing, and this is more on the standardization problem, Backstage comes with uh, what we call templates or a scaffolder, it's kind of two names for it. And the scaffolder is a way to give your teams self-service capabilities so that they can get things done on the platforms inside your company. You know, um, the last group talked about how important this was, totally agree, but you wanna empower your teams to uh, take actions like creating GitHub repos or creating new websites or software in a kind of standardized way that has the best practices of your organization 
built in. So the platform team is empowering these people and not blocking them or gatekeeping their, their path to production. All right, so you know, um, this is Backstage. It's been around for about three years. Um, a lot of people have adopted it. A lot of companies are in various different states of adoptions. And, and the deployment, uh, the question about how to deploy Backstage is really kind of relatively solved at this point. Spotify are doing a lot of work in order to speed this up, um, in, both in the open source and in some, uh, some commercial features. Um, at Rody, you know, we've basically solved this problem for our customers also. It takes eight minutes to get a Backstage tenant on Rody. Um, and you could just log in and, and start using it and start setting it up, right? So um, the deployment piece is relatively solved at this point. And, and I think the community has moved on to this question of, well, now that we've got Backstage, how do we adopt it? How do we get our teams to use it? How do we get the most value from Backstage? Um, and, and that's certainly where we're focused on really now. And it can be quite difficult to get best practices or, or find guides about how to adopt Backstage, um, and, which is kind of surprising, but, you know, there's different cu cultures in different companies, different setups, different tools. And so there's a lot of complexity when it comes to ba adopting Backstage. Um, and so there's not really one canonical guide to how to adopt Backstage. But about six months ago, I decided I was going to try and distill the best information that I could about adopting Backstage so that I could empower this community and help people move a little bit faster when it comes to adoption. And so, you know, I've been working with Rody uh, now for three years. We've got a lot of customers who have adopted Backstage and are getting a lot of value from it. And we've learned some lessons from that, and we certainly try to apply those to every new customer who comes along and to share that information. Um, but I wanted to make sure that there isn't something that we're doing at Rody that's different than what the open source community does, than what the, the self-hosted backstage adopters do. Um, and so I set out then about six months ago to interview as many self-hosted backstage adopters as I could and try to learn some lessons from them and see what they were doing and see what success that they were having. Um, as a pure open source project with their own customizations built in. Um, I ended up talking to about 27 people. Uh, I've included 20 of them in this data set, and we'll kind of talk through the, the, the quality of data or the demographics of who those companies were um, in a few minutes. Now, how I conducted these interviews is maybe as you might expect. I started in the Backstage GitHub repository. There is an adopters.md file in there where people have registered the fact that they're adopting Backstage started at the top of it and just emailed people and reached out on LinkedIn and tried to talk to people, um, as many people as I could, uh, and, and just had conversations with them, right? It was um, you know, relatively standard interviews, uh, asked them some questions and, and tried to record the responses. Um, I asked relatively straightforward questions and kind of like easy to answer questions, like do you use software templates at your company? Or how are you populating your catalog in Backstage? Um, and just recorded the answers from people and tried to extract some lessons from it. Now, there are potentially a couple of sources of error in uh, this data set that I do want to mention, and I think it's important to recognize. So firstly, this wasn't a survey. I didn't necessarily ask exactly standardized questions of each of the companies that I talked to. These were conversations, you know, it, it was two humans basically talking over Zoom, um, and I didn't want to just robotically just ask you know, exactly the same questions to each people. And I was trying to learn from them at the end of the day. And so I wanted to let them talk. So there is some kind of nuance to how the different questions were, were asked. And, and, you know, I'll try and address that in the data set as we go through. There's potentially some bias in the answers that I got from the people I spoke to. You know, if you are, if you've been working on rolling out the scaffolder feature of Backstage at your company for the last six months, and I come along and ask, has it been successful? You're kind of incentivized to say yes, um, and so you know maybe there is some bias that in the answers that people gave me. Maybe they were a little bit too optimistic um, or pessimistic, um, depending on their mood that day. And then lastly, I would say that there is probably some bias on my part, right? I'm a human at the end of the day. I was interpreting these answers and trying to extract information from them, um, and so maybe I want the scaffolder to be successful myself. And I'm slightly invested in the backstage community, as you might imagine, um, and so we just have to be aware of that also. You're going to see some quotes from adopters in these slides. Um, I have a lot of quotes from people um, that, that I wrote down as, as I was interviewing people. I haven't directly attributed these quotes to the companies who gave them. Um, so you're just going to have to believe me to a certain extent. The, it, it would have involved speaking to the legal and marketing departments of each of these companies in order to get permission to attribute the quotes. And some of them are gigantic organizations with 6,000 engineers. and. 
um, I, I would have trouble even reaching those people, never mind explaining what backstage is and actually getting permission to give quotes from their uh, from their employees to any sort of public forum I wanted. It didn't seem worth doing. Uh, maybe I'll come back around and, and actually get that done for a future version of this presentation, but um, you'll see the quotes, you'll see that they, they kind of match the reality and, and, uh, and I think they'll make sense when you see them. 20 companies is a relatively small sample size, but I think the real value here is in the quality of data and in the kind of discussions that have that I had and, and the lessons that I was able to extract from it. But we will try to um, extract as much uh, quantitative data also, and I'll get to that shortly. All right, so let's take a look at the demographics first and kind of see who I was able to speak to. Um, so 20 companies in total, uh, five of them were more than 2,000 engineers. So relatively big organizations. The biggest was uh, 6,000 engineers and, um, and they got kind of progressively smaller from there. There was a few companies, two companies in the 500 to 1.5 thousand engineers range. And then the majority of them were less than 500 uh, engineers just because that is the way the majority of companies are out there in the world. Uh, the smallest was about 80 engineers. So really like we're covering the full spectrum of, um, of engineering teams. I was uh, specifically looking to speak to companies who had a lot of backstage experience. Um, and so most of the data set have been working with backstage for more than two years, right? So they've had time to deploy it, to pick the plugins they want to use, to configure it how they want, and then also to roll it out at their company or attempt to roll it out. Um, and you know, this is very intentional. I wasn't trying to learn lessons about how they deploy backstage. Um, I was trying to learn about the success that they'd had with it over a significant period of time. Um, and so hopefully the, the data set kind of reflects that. There was a lot of companies or a few companies that I just, you know, um, I spoke to, but then I excluded what they told me from the results just because they hadn't been working the backstage long enough and they hadn't really faced some of the problems that the companies that had been working with it uh, longer. All right, so let's just dive into some of the quantitative data about this first and, and see what we can extract from, uh, from the, the interviews. Okay, so I talked a little bit earlier on about the, the software catalog feature of Backstage. You do need to populate that with information about the software that your teams are producing. There's a couple of different ways of doing that with Backstage. Um, and, and one of the first questions I asked was just, how are you doing that, right? Um, the most common way was with what we call catalog info YAML files. And basically what these are, are YAML files that describe or, or kind of record information about the software a team is producing inside the repository where the code lives, right? Typically GitHub, you're gonna have a YAML file in there, you'll call it this, and you'll put information in there like the name of the piece of software, the owner of the software, whether or not it's deployed to production, et cetera. And there's a specification um, for this that comes with Backstage and is, you know, has evolved over the years. Um, some companies were lucky enough to have an existing catalog that was mature inside their company, right? It might be a, a repository which has some other type of YAML format in it, which describes the software the teams are building. And those companies were lucky in the sense that they were able to just get backstage and connect it to that existing source of truth and populate their catalog from that. And we'll talk a bit more uh, later on about the success that those companies had. There was also a set of companies who used what we would call custom processors. Um, so they would basically uh, write some sort of a script that would kind of scrape information from known sources, right? Maybe GitHub. Uh, so one company had written a, a, a custom processor that connected to GitHub and extracted as much information from each repository as possible in order to populate the, the, the backstage catalog. So I talked a bit about the scaffolder feature earlier on. This was one of the most successful features of Backstage. Um, the question I asked was, do you use the scaffolder and are you successful with it? It's interesting to note that not a single company felt like they had failed to get value from the scaffolder feature of Backstage, right? Um, half of them, approximately half had tried and succeeded and another nine had not made any attempt. Um, in some cases, because they had an existing uh, tool for templating out new repositories or providing self-service capabilities um, uh, from what the platform team were able to provide. And so they just didn't feel like they needed the scaffolder. Um, a lot of them were planning to use it in the future and just hadn't gotten around to it. Tech docs, um, so kind of a mixed bag when it comes to putting technical documentation inside Backstage. Uh, six companies felt like they had succeeded with tech docs and it was widely adopted inside their company. 
six companies had, had tried to use tech docs and, and hadn't had a lot of success for various different reasons. Um, six companies were too early. They just, you know, they felt like tech docs was something that they were planning to get around to, but they weren't far enough into their adoption uh, journey in order to actually really try and drive major success with it. And then two companies, I just forgot to ask about tech docs. And so this kind of speaks to the, uh, the, the, the fallibility of my interviewing method, but, um, you know, trying to be candid about the data and, and be honest about it. Yeah. Two of them, I just didn't even ask. Maturity metrics then were another kind of popular thing that people wanted to talk about. So when I say maturity metrics, what I mean here is the idea that you are capturing information about the maturity of, so of the software that your teams are building inside Backstage. So, you know, it's obviously a catalog. You can look up a piece of software and how a lot of companies want to use it is they want to see information about the security, reliability, the deployability, the ease of um, use of that software or ease of maybe like getting started with development. They want to see that kind of certification information inside Backstage in the catalog. And many of them had built their own tooling from scratch into Backstage in order to actually facilitate this. So nine, almost half of the companies had spent their own engineering effort building a some tooling for measuring maturity of software into the backstage catalog five of them um, so half the cohort had not done this but half of those um, or a quarter of the entire data set plan to do so in the near future and, and described it as being on their backstage roadmap five hadn't tried it all and then one i didn't ask Plugins, then lastly, you know, um, I mentioned what plugins are earlier on, earlier on. They provide that kind of visibility into other tooling from backstage. Um, uh, kind of divisive, right? Eight companies felt like they hadn't had a lot of success with the the, uh, the the plugins in backstage. Six were too early and hadn't really rolled out plugins in any sort of meaningful way. Um, four companies had succeeded. Two of those felt like they had succeeded with open source plugins that the backstage community provides. And then two felt like they were using open source plugins, but most of the value came from custom plugins that they had written themselves. These are bespoke uh, plugins that basically live only inside their um, uh, their company. You know, custom plugins that they built for bespoke workflows that really only their engineers have done. They haven't necessarily open sourced them either because they just didn't wouldn't make sense for somebody else to use. Okay, so that's the quantitative data. Um, and, and, and kind of, you know, gives you an overview of the types of questions I asked and the responses that I got. Um, but there was also, you know, conversation that happened after this or, or lessons that people shared uh, uh, that, that I've tried to distill. And also, you know, some kind of patterns that you can extract from the quantitative data also. And so, you know, let's talk about those. So firstly, software templates in Backstage can be an early win for adopters and can be a really good place to start. Again, templates are uh, a way that you can empower your end users, the app devs in your organization, to um, self-service uh, capabilities that the platform team are providing. Right. So a simple example is I want to create a Java microservice in this organization. You can come along to Backstage. You can pick a template for a Java microservice. You run it. It takes 15 minutes. And you know you'll get a uh, a new GitHub repository with a microservice in there. It'll probably have documentation. It'll have tests, um, best practices already built into it. And you're just really quickly getting started with the best practices of your organization built in. Um, and so these are this is a really good place to start because it doesn't have a cold start problem. Okay, as a platform team, you can just write some templates, hand them over to the application developers in your team, and they can just get started with them straight away. Now, maybe you know a microservice is not something that you're creating every single day, depending on your architecture. But there are other capabilities that people um, will need to run much more frequently. Uh, simple things like I don't know, creating an AWS account or um, uh, requesting a budget increase, or maybe interacting with infrastructure as code tools. A lot of our customers are, are using the templates in that way, um, and so people can get started straight away. There's no barrier to entry, and uh, there is a you know, there's value to be had on day one. And, and so it can be a good place to start with backstage adoption. There's also like a really clear ROI um, on uh, return on investment for software templates. So, you know, if you have a process which takes two months to run right now, I mean, I remember back in Workday when we were creating new software, you had to follow this multi-page confluent blueprint to check off all the boxes as you went along. And it honestly could take two months to get a new piece of software into production for the first time. Um, with templates, some customers, I mean, one of our customers has reduced a two-month 
deployment process or, or new service creation process down to 15 minutes. Um, and so it's really easy to just point to that win, say, OK, well, we create a new microservice approximately 20 times a year. Uh, an engineer costs X and you can just multiply things out and talk about how many hundreds of thousands of dollars you've saved with Backstage. And that matters when you're trying to make space or get budget for a new project and, um, and kind of justify the existence of the project. So it, it can be a great way to get an early win that you can report upwards and then justify the existence of more invest investment in, uh, in Backstage. Not all automation tasks are equal, and so they're not all as equally successful with uh, the Backstage Scaffolder. You should prefer tasks that are run frequently by the engineering organization. So, you know, one of our, one company um, described that they had created a template to automate a process that happened about once a year. And the problem with that was that, the, you know, every year when they came around to running it again, the process had changed because the ecosystem in the company had changed. And so the template needed rewriting each time. And so there wasn't as much value in automating a, a task like that. And then obviously the more complex or the more time a task takes, the more suitable it can be for automation with the scaffolder. Uh, and one of the things that was, you know, kind of important here was was lead time, right? If um, if you have to open a ticket for another team and then you have to wait for something to happen, you're just kind of stuck for no really good reason. You're just in, in some sort of ticketing queue. And so if you can automate those uh, loops end to end, then you can really speed people up um, and create more self service uh, operability for the platform team. Now. Another thing that kind of that came through in the interviews was that it's it's really beneficial to encourage contribution from other teams in your organization, as long as the templates can be used by multiple different teams, right? They shouldn't be specific to one particular team. Some companies do come to me in, in sales calls and, and you know when they're getting started with Backstage with this idea that they want to lock the templates down, right? Only we should be able to create them, the platform team, or only some group of architects should be able to create them. Um, and that's not really the way to think about it. If you want to drive mass adoption of Backstage, you do want contribution from lots of other teams. You want to get them involved with Backstage and get them contributing to Backstage inside your company. And so don't be afraid to uh, uh, empower and kind of educate people about how they can use templates to create self-service workflows for their, their internal customers or, or other teams that they depend on. So just some quotes here about the scaffolder, right? Um, you know, 5,000 engineering company, scaffolder is the king feature of Backstage. 99.8% of applications are created with the scaffolder, okay? You can imagine if you've got 5,000 engineers uh, and a microservices architecture, there's a lot of new services being created um, very regularly. 99.8% of those are covered by uh, scaffolder templates, right? So that's a lot of standardization that you're getting using Backstage as the, the kind of core engine of that. Um, here's a 2000 engineer company saying we've reduced some tasks from a month to a few minutes, right? Imagine how frequently those tasks might run in the 2000 engineer company and the kind of value or the ROI that that, that organization is getting. Um, and then lastly, 120 engineers. This is actually a, a fintech. Uh, they've spoken publicly about this a fintech in, in um, Denmark, I think, called Lunar Bank. And so they've been so successful that they've actually locked down GitHub. GitHub so that people can't just come along and create repositories randomly. They have to go through the scaffolder and the templates that the platform team have provided. And you know they've talked publicly about the compliance benefits that they've gotten from that. Every uh, repository is created in a standardized way, and they can be confident about the security and reliability of it. OK, the next most important thing is to make catalog population easy. OK, it's important to have a complete, correct, and rich backstage catalog because there's a lot of knock-on effects in terms of how you use the other features like plugins and how reliable they are when people visit the uh, visit the catalog. You won't get the full value of Backstage unless you get you make catalog population easy. It's also an interesting problem in that it faces a cold start problem. Okay, you know the more stuff that you get into the catalog, the more reason people have to go there and and reference the catalog and use it, and then the more pressure that they feel to add their own software into the catalog. And so there are network effects when it comes to the catalog, a bit like Facebook um, or a, a social network. And so um, really kind of like bootstrapping that or, or um, getting over that initial hump can be uh, quite important. And it, it's something that I think is worth thinking through as you're early in your backstage journey. Now, I talked a little bit earlier on about these, these YAML files that can live inside the repositories of each piece of software or each repository in your company. 
and, and describe some metadata about that software. Um, this is the most common way that people try to get started with backstage uh, catalog population. It's also, I think, quite a difficult path. So of the data set of the 12, 20 companies I spoke to, 12 of them had tried it and only two were really happy with the results. And you can see some of the quotes here. Um, a 2000 engineer company who'd been working with Backstage for two years felt like the catalog never really worked for them. Uh, a lot of the information was wrong when they pushed adoption and so they struggled with trust. That they had succeeded with the scaffolder and other features of Backstage and so this was actually okay. They were still happy with Backstage, but this is a challenge that they had. Um, and another company, you know, after one year, only 30 or 40 percent of the active repositories were in the backstage catalog. And now, of course, you know, these are these are isolated incidents. There are cultural and other reasons why this might be the case. Some companies don't necessarily have the top down support that they need um, in order to be successful with the catalog. But it is interesting that this uh, is the case. Um, some lessons here. Firstly, it's it's doubtful that you're going to succeed without both bottoms of adoption, but also a stick to go along with your card. Um, typical sticks in, in, in companies you had had good success with, with the catalog info YAML file were um, the fact that you couldn't deploy without a catalog info YAML file. Um, so, you know, maybe, you know, it's like you kind of have to have at least a bare bones uh, description of the metadata of your software in order to be able to get your software into production. Okay, that's a really good stick. People want to get their stuff deployed. And so you're going to see a lot higher adoption if you are able to put something like that into place. Second lesson is that, and this one comes you know, primarily from, from, uh, from Twilio, who I didn't actually interview as part of this cohort, but they've spoken about this recently quite publicly. And I think it's a really good example. Some other companies had kind of copied it. Um, if you share your adoption numbers publicly inside the company, just make them really visible inside Backstage that can help to gamify or, or give people an incentive to kind of get that number up, right? Um, they feel, they see it growing and they want to be part of it and they want to contribute to it. Uh, and, and, and this can, can really help. So um, Jesse Adamets from Twilio spoke about this actually recently in the Autodesk Developer Productivity Summit uh, and kind of showed exactly how to do this inside Twilio. It's worth looking up, that talk is on YouTube. Um, you can check it out whenever you want. But being really public and, and kind of reporting upwards, your adoption number can help get support for backstage catalog population. And if you want to succeed, um, that can be a really good thing to do. Now, you might think, all right, well, if we need to create this catalog info YAML file, uh, I know a really easy way to do it. Let's just open an automated pull request against all of the repositories we have in order to add this, uh, this metadata. Now, I've seen mixed results with that, both in the, the people I interviewed, but also in our own customer bases. Um, you can reduce frictions, friction with, by opening an automated pull request and explaining in the pull request why it's important to merge this. Um, but I mean, I, I've seen companies where some or factions of the organization will just refuse to, to participate. They don't want to get involved. They don't want to, they don't want to, um, to, uh, they don't really see the value for them yet because the catalog is not populated yet. Remember, and those network effects uh, do exist. So. Um, you need to be a bit, you need to put a bit of thought into this and, and kind of understand your culture if you're going to go down this path. I would also say I've seen the most success where people start with a small group of early adopters, make them really successful, and then open an automated PR against the rest of the organization in order to kind of complete the catalog. Because then you're able to demonstrate value and you're not going out cold on day one. You also need to think about the day two operations here, right? If you want to, if you do do this and you put a catalog info YAML file via automated PR into a, uh, a lot of like maybe let's say 800 or 1000 repositories in your company you need to think about how you're going to change that over time and um, what if you need to add some metadata to it to all of those repositories on day two well then uh, you need to open another 800 or 1000 uh, pull requests effectively and and so that can be a problem and that can be a sticking point um, there are some places where it can be really this can be a really successful approach. Mono Reapers are one one of the companies in the cohort that I spoke to had uh, something like two thousand services in one gigantic GitHub Mono Repo, and so they were able to just write a script to open a pull request against that uh, Mono Repo. One person, one very trusted person, just reviewed it, clicked merge, and bang, they had populated two thousand pieces of software into their backstage catalog. Um, so that's that can be if you are a mono repo company, company, this can be a really good path forward, and you probably will be successful in populating your catalog with it. Start slow, like I was saying, you know, prove the value. Um, 
use those early adopters, evangelize them to the rest of the company. You don't get to skip that evangelization piece if you are trying to open an automated pull request against uh, organizations. You will need to, to talk to teams, right? This is a human problem at the end of the day or an organizational problem at the end of the day. Um, and you can only solve so much of it with technology. Now, the most successful way to populate your backstage catalog was via integration and custom processors. Seven of seven companies who went down this path succeeded with it and were happy with the results. Um, the, uh, you know, th the most successful way to do this was via integrating with an existing software catalog that had been around in the company for a really long time and was tied into deployment tools and really was mandatory. Um, so if you have that, that's great. Of course, it's not something that you can really just start from scratch uh, if you don't have that history to lean on. And so it's not much help if you don't have it. But if you do, I think you should think about um, integrating with it rather than trying to replace it. Um, if you don't have that, the best way to succeed is to put a lot of effort into automation of um, catalog population. Okay, Try to read as much information from existing sources as you can so that you're not asking developers to create this catalog info YAML file one by one. Uh, and, and you're really kind of relying on, on information that already exists. Um, so it's worth thinking through where you might pull this information from. Maybe you do want to scrape GitHub repositories um, in order to kind of create the metadata that goes into Backstage and try to bootstrap that catalog population so you get over that hump when it comes to the network effects. Um, so just to summarize this, yeah, so YAML can be a, hard, a long and hard road. You can do it, right? I've seen companies, some of our customers have gotten to 60 70% adoption through evangelization and because their cultures are quite receptive to these ideas uh, and they've really done a good a good job of spreading awareness of backstage um but it, you do need to put effort in and it's going to be a difficult journey um existing registries and automated discovery are key now at Rody, we're doing some things on top of backstage to make these processes much easier right so we're building clis and apis to bootstrap from existing sources kubernetes clusters argo cd GitHub repositories, right? All of these places are sources of information that you can combine together in order to bootstrap a catalog. And so we feel like that's the direction to go and the way that we speed people up. And then on the day two operations, we're enabling people to edit metadata of services inside Rody so that they don't necessarily have to go back and open pull requests against existing catalog info YAML files. And, you know, I mentioned Twilio earlier on, they independently came up with the same idea that we had for their own internal backstage instance. And they've talked, spoken publicly about how they built this capability for decorating uh, entities that are backed off the YAML files rather than having to edit all those YAML files individually. We also, of course, have solutions engineering and customer success teams that will work with organizations in order to really speed them up and kind of hold their hand when it comes to uh, bootstrapping the catalog. And we feel like that really empowers people to um, have a have a, a complete correct and rich catalog at the end of the day all right so tech doc stand you know i mentioned earlier on this is a bit of a mixed bag the real reason why this, this is it seemed from looking at the data set is that um some companies had an existing documentation solution that they were happy with right so um if you have an engineering organization who's used to going to a place and consuming technical documentation in a, a specific way and confidence it turns out doesn't count in this case because people can't find anything but it's really hard to just move them over to tech docs if they have a place that they're going to there's just too much inertia in that uh in the way that they're currently doing things the second reason really is that you know tech docs works in a very specific way it's what's called a docs like code approach you write your documentation in Markdown files alongside your code, and it goes through the pull request uh, and peer review process that your actual code would. And so that's great because your documentation gets reviewed and it's easy to point out um, places where it needs to be fixed as part of that review process. But it is a slightly different way than some people like to write documentation. And so if you're used to using a WYSIWYG editor where you can just log in like Notion or Google Docs or whatever to write documentation, it can be difficult to get the people over the hump of learning uh, a new way to do things. If you are going to try and push uh, tech docs and, and, and generate adoption of it inside your company, again, it's really important to reduce the friction as much of it, as much as you can. One of the really easy ways that you can do this and one of the ways that we've seen successful in, in the interview co cohort was basically by um, 
uh, creating a scaffolder template to allow people to add technical documentation into their repositories so that they could just come along, run the scaffolder template. It would set up their repository with all of the, the, the kind of uh, um, configuration that they need to get started with TechDocs, and it's a much easier way for them to understand how to, how to get started working with it. API specs, again, something that you can put inside the Backstage Catalog alongside the software that your teams are building. Super um, use case for generating a high amount of daily active usage of Backstage. So um, one of the companies who've, who've spoken publicly about this is Zalando. They have 6,000 engineers. They have 43% daily active usage of Backstage inside their engineering organization, right? So it's a critical piece of technology and the most frequent use case for them is engineers looking up API specifications for software that's built inside the company, right? It's an API portal for them. Now, they've put a lot of effort into making sure that that works really well. So they have invested in uh, technologies that will introspect services while they're on the way to production, produce an API spec, put that into backstage, version it, make it searchable, um, and a whole bunch of other stuff that makes it really easy to find these API specs and make sure that they're up to date. You will likely have to think about the same thing. You won't just get that for free out of the box with Backstage. But if you can, um, uh, if you can get a lot of API specs for useful services inside Backstage, it will drive a lot of a lot of usage. We're of course um, offering some some uh, some features on Rody out of the box to make this a little bit easier for you. Plugins again, you know, I said mixed bag. I think it's important to be really be intentional about the plugins you want to use. Don't just throw in open source plugins just because they happen to exist. Think about the problems you're trying to solve with plugins in the backstage catalog. How are you trying to speed up your engineers? The most common uh, or the best plugins are ones which will create new workflows for engineers, right? If you think about a high friction process where you have to go through 20 steps and um, in order to get something done and people still have to do it, if you are able to wrap that in a plugin, put it into the backstage catalog and make it visible for people, they will certainly go there to use it instead of the old workflow they were uh, using before. Um, larger companies are gonna have to also invest in kind of education programs and empowering other teams to produce plugin, okay? You want, you're gonna want plugins in there for workflows that you don't necessarily understand the business logic is owned by other teams. And so the best bet there and the way, the way some companies from the interview cohort succeeded was by educating those teams, not building plugins for them, but embedding in them, giving them documentation, teaching them how to write plugins and making it really easy for them so that they could, uh, um, you know, they, they had maybe 30 plugins, 30, 30 uh, internal plugins being developed at the same time from internal teams. And all of that stuff goes into backstage and makes it a, uh, increases the gravity of it, makes it a magnet. Software quality metrics or software maturity metrics, I mentioned earlier on, half of the people I spoke to were investing their own engineering effort in this. There's two main methods for it really. One is surveys that live inside Backstage and ask uh, engineering managers questions. You know, does your service um, consume PII, for example, was a common question. And then they, were, they store that information and then they report it in Backstage. When you look at the piece of software, you can see um, the, the quality metrics of it. The second way was a bit more automated. So they were scraping GitHub repositories, let's say recording versions of libraries that each piece of software used, and then reporting that inside Backstage so that you could spot software that was using old versions of Java or whatever else it means. This is a really good way to get value from Backstage without driving high daily active usage against the, against the, organiz um, the engineering organization. So people won't necessarily log in every single day in order to participate in these software quality metrics, but you will get a lot of, um, exact value from having that peace of mind that your software is compliant, secure, and reliable. Um, and that's a high value use case that you can get a lot of, that you can get value from without, you know, having to get every single engineer in your organization involved in Backstage. Um, we, of course, are building our own technologies on top of Backstage in order to support this. We call it Tech Insights, and it gives you the ability to create scorecards, automated checks, and a whole bunch of other stuff inside Backstage that you can then use to measure the maturity of the software that you're building. So then just to kind of summarize everything, right? The two paths are improving discoverability and improving software maturity. You're always gonna to have to automate catalog collection. Right? It's worth investing in that, getting that right. Discoverability, if you wanna have high daily active usage of Backstage, you wanna invest in tech docs, API specs, and custom plugins, it's gonna take some time, right? You're gonna to have to build up all this documentation, these API specs and these custom plugins. And so you're not gonna necessarily see tons of value on day one. 
you're looking at a six, 12 month kind of time frame in order to, to really drive that high usage. If you want to measure software maturity or improve standardization, then you can invest in scaffolder templates on day one, and then you can measure software maturity with scorecards. You won't get high daily active usage this way, um, but you will get a lot of value from reducing security and compliance risk, and you will end up with improved software maturity at the end of the day. Okay, that's it for me. Uh, I am David Chu. I am the, the founder and CEO of Rody. You can email me here, David at Rody.io. I'm also available on LinkedIn and everywhere else. Thank you, David. Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, there's a question from the audience. Do you think Backstage is still useful for smaller teams, possibly with a monolith app, or is it designed specifically for multi-apps microservices landscape? Yeah, so I certainly think that there's a threshold um, in terms of the size of the organization for which Backstage is useful, right? The smallest organizations that we work with at Rody are about 50 engineers. And so the reason for that really is it's not specific to, to Backstage really, but it's because if you're 10 engineers sitting in one room, you don't necessarily have that discoverability problem that Backstage can help to solve or that standardization problem. And I would also say, you know, the, the cost of, of deploying and operating and maintaining backstage is high. Um, and so, you're, you know, you're not, I mean, so like Zalando, for example, have, have five engineers on their backstage team, right? They have 6,000 6, engineers that they're supporting, but it's a significant investment. Um, Rody makes that a little bit easier, but still you're not gonna have the bandwidth for that at 10, 20 engineers. Okay, very clear, thank you. Uh, thank you, David, for your presence here and uh, see you soon. Thank you. Hmm.